now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. You will hear a conversation between a student and a job advisor. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Is this uh, uh, room number 26? Yes, that's right. So, is this the student job centre? It certainly is. How can I help you? Well, actually, I'm looking for a job, mm -hmm. a part-time job. Do you have anything available at the moment? Ah, uh, yes. Are you a registered student? I'm afraid this service is only available to full-time students. Yes, I am. I'm doing a degree in business studies. Here's my student card. Which year are you in? Well, I've been at uni for four years, but I'm in the third year because I took last year off. Right. Well, let's just have a look at what positions are available at the moment. Uh, there's a job working at the reception desk at the sports centre for three evenings a week. That's Wednesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. Oh, that sounds like fun, but unfortunately I have evening lectures, so mm. that's not possible, I'm afraid. Is there anything during the day? OK, that's no good then. Um, what about cleaning? There's a position for a cleaner at the childcare centre. Right. But you'd need to be there at 6am. Does that appeal? Six o'clock in the morning? Oh, that's far too early for me, I'm afraid. I'd, I'd never make it that early in the morning. Hmm. Well, there was a position going in the computer lab for three days a week that might be OK. Ah, here it is. No, it's in the library, not the lab. A uh, clerical assistant required. I think it mostly involves putting the books back on the shelves. Oh, no, hang on. It's for Wednesday and Friday evenings again. No, I can't manage that because of the lectures. <laughs> OK, I'm getting the idea. Uh, look, I'll just get a few details from you anyway, and then we can check through the list and see what comes up. You will hear part of a lecture about a chemical substance called monosodium glutamate. Now listen carefully. In today's lecture, I'm going to talk about monosodium glutamate, or MSG as it's more commonly known. Now, MSG, as you probably know, is a flavor enhancer which is used particularly in Chinese and Japanese cooking. Today, I am going to explore why it is so popular in these cuisines and, more importantly, how does it enhance the flavor of food. The main reason why MSG is more commonly used in Japanese meals is tradition. For many thousands of years, the Japanese have incorporated a type of seaweed known as kombu in their cooking, as they discovered it had the ability to make food taste better. But it wasn't until 1908 that the ingredient in kombu, which was responsible for the improvement in flavor, was actually discovered to be glutamate by scientists working there. From 1908 until 1956, glutamate was produced commercially in Japan by a very slow and expensive means of extraction. It was in 1956 that the speed of the process was improved and industrial production increased dramatically and still continues to increase to this day. In fact, hundreds of thousands of tons of MSG are produced all over the world today. So what exactly is MSG? Well, monosodium glutamate contains 78.2% glutamate, 12.2% sodium, and 9.6% water. Glutamate is an amino acid that can be found naturally in all protein-containing foods. Um, so this includes foods such as meat and cheese. It is widely known that Chinese and Japanese food contains MSG, but many people don't seem to be aware that it is also used in foods in other parts of the world. 
For example, it is found in commercially made Italian pizzas, in American fast food, and in Britain, MSG is used in things like potato crisps. So, how exactly does MSG work? Well, in the Western world, we commonly talk of four tastes, and I'm sure you're all familiar with the concepts of sweet, sour, bitter, and salt. Well, in 1908, Kikunae Ikeda identified a fifth taste, and it is thought that MSG intensifies this naturally occurring taste in some food. It does make perfect evolutionary sense that we should have the ability to detect or taste glutamate because it is the amino acid which is most common in natural foods. John Prescott, an associate professor at the University of Chicago, suggests that this fifth taste serves a purpose just as the other tastes do. He suggests that it signals to us the presence of protein in food, in the same way that sweetness indicates that a food contains energy-giving carbohydrates. Bitterness, he says, alerts us to toxins in the food, while sourness warns us of spoilage and saltiness signals the presence of minerals. So, what else do we know about this fifth taste?